signals to the, like, the, the, the consumer that you're going to get quality care, right? So I get that certification, I have more knowledge, right? Um, and I can be more productive as an auto mechanic, okay? But unlike that snap-on tool chest, you know, someone can run away with that tool chest, right? That ASC certification and the education, the training that went into that certification becomes inseparable from me, okay? So you get, a, you, you're here, all of you are here at this institution of higher ed, you get a year's worth of classes, that's going to yield some kind of return in your earning potential. Okay? Uh, so that's the human capital effect. Now the sheepskin effect, I didn't name it, but back in the day before paper, and before parchment, they used skins, right, as, as, as a way of recording things, like in Britain. So you go, you get like uh, some training, you do something good, right, you have the sheepskin, you take it back to your employer, right, and they reward you for it. Okay? Well, so this effect is more of like a, it sends a signal, right? So HR may say, hey, we have 100 applications, we have two positions, like how are we gonna screen, right? 
So like either you send that signal, right, or you don't, but if you send that signal, right, you get an interview, okay? So both of these effects are a result of your education. Both of these effects, like this gets you in the door, this makes you more productive, right? Um, so a combination of the two effects of, of you being here, investing in your education, are gonna increase your ability to learn, right? And not learn, but earn, right? Sorry, rhymes with learn. Um, so that's what it does for the individual, but then if we talk about society, what does it do um, for the community or society, right? So there's this, this word, externalities, right? It's the cost or benefit borne on to someone other than the decision maker, okay? So um, Ayers and Levitt, they wrote a paper that dealt with LoJack, okay? Um, and it really highlighted like what an externality was. It was a nice application. There's a lot of crime statistics, so they were able to test it empirically, okay? Um, so what LoJack is, it's something in your car, it's an anti-theft device, but it's not seen you, you know, uh, it has GPS capability, so if someone steals your car, you report it stolen, and the police can go, oh, your car's right here, right? Uh, police can go and say, oh, well, we're gonna turn off the power uh, 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 of that car, so like, the, the car just like, stops running, the criminal like, pulls over, runs away, and then you can return your car, okay? Um, so the, this thing, LoJack, it prevents crime. So we're talking about a cost or benefit borne on to someone other than the decision maker. Okay, and what these two authors, Ayers and Levitt, claim is that LoJack, there's a positive externality associated with it. Okay, so there's a positive benefit to like someone other than me when I make the decision to install this in my car. And, and when they talk about it, okay, so in 1994 when they gathered the data, right, that GPS ca capability Right, uh, 53 chop shops were shut down in the city of LA as a result of this. Several criminals were like arrested on the side of the road trying to restart the car. Okay, so the thing about this is, is like nobody knows. If I'm walking up to a car and I say, "Hey, that's a nice Toyota. I want it. It's not mine." I don't know whether Lojack is installed in there, right? But if I had a, a thing like the club. Let's assume that this actually deters theft, right? I walk by that, I look, I see the club, and I'm like, oh, I'm not gonna be able to steal that car. I'll go on to the next car. Okay, so the club, you know, I, I value my car. There's a cost of the club. I make a decision as a decision maker. I'm gonna invest in the club. But by installing that, all I do is, I prevent my car from getting stolen, but I also increase, not all I do, but I also increase the likelihood that someone else's car will be stolen. Right, because they can see that. But this, nobody knows where it is. Uh, arrest rates increase, the likelihood of being caught stealing a car increased a lot. So it actually acted as a deterrent to theft, and criminals were caught in the car trying to start it because the police shut down like the, the, the power to, to the wheels, and they were able to find cars at their end destination, the chop shops, shutting those down, okay, and those chop shops were creating the demand for the stolen cars. Okay, so there's a positive externality associated with LoJack and, temp uh, and, and potentially a negative externality uh, associated with the club. Okay, and what I'd like to do next is make the case for education having a positive externality. Okay, so we, we talked about the sheepskin effect, human capital. Okay, that's me as a decision maker. I decide to make an investment into my education, okay, and I'm weighing the cost of that investment to the potential returns. Okay, but there's returns, there's a benefit that goes beyond me. It's gonna impact society as a whole, it's gonna affect, impact my regional economy, maybe even the nation, okay? So, you know, positive externalities, uh, some other examples of positive externalities, uh, uh, like vaccines, okay? If I get vaccinated, not only do I not get the flu or like some horrible disease, I, I also don't, transmit it to someone else. There's a positive benefit for that, and the policy implication of that is generally government will subsidize the positive externalities. Okay, a negative externality, here's a perfect example, right? Okay, so I, I look at the cost of a pack of cigarettes, I take my own benefit from this pack of cigarettes into account, okay, but if I lit a cigarette right now, I'd negatively impact all of them. Okay, so the policy implication of the negative externality is you normally tax it. Okay, and anyone who's purchased cigarettes over the past like two decades, 
And that was that the, pri the prices increase exponentially, and that's what the government does, right? So you want to encourage consumption of the positive, right, and deter consumption of the negative, okay? And again, I want to make the case that education has a positive externality associated with it, okay? You're more productive, okay? Maybe you're just, it's a simple thing, you're nicer, right? Like education is like big tree's worst enemy. Okay, so you're nicer, you're more affable, uh, you're more conscientious of the world that you live in, right? Those are positive things for society, but you're, you're, you're more productive primarily, okay? And I have an example of PayPal. They were, they were a subsidiary of eBay. They were trying to like figure out where they wanted to relocate. Um, and here's a quote, right? So this is, this is a guy from PayPal. And he's like, okay, well, we chose the Austin market, why? Right? Healthcare, education, cultural amenities, right? And it has a strong educational base, right? So Austin, through its, you know, uh, where is it? University of Texas in Austin, produced a lot of uh, 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 graduates. Those graduates were ready for work. They were educated. They, they had the skills that PayPal needed, and that made Austin attractive to PayPal. But more importantly, these cultural amenities, Right? Everyone talks about taxes, taxes, taxes as a means to like recruit businesses to your area. Okay? Um, there's healthcare. That requires an education system to, to fund healthcare. Okay? Here, like Everett Community College, right? They have, they have an expanded healthcare program. You know, uh, the UW, they have the medical college, right? This area has a pretty nice healthcare system. Okay? Cultural amenities. Right? What do we have here? We have a culinary arts and like culinary arts school, right? Okay. If, if I'm gonna like want to attract talent and skills to Austin, and I'm PayPal, right? Maybe those people that are considering Austin want to like have a nice place to have a meal, right? Maybe they want to take their kids to like some cultural event, like a play, symphony, something like that, right? So, so the, these amenities are a huge draw for companies and huge job for areas, okay? And education feeds the healthcare industry. Education feeds education, right? K through 12 education, right? We're trying to attack ta attract talent. Well, I'm a parent. I'm concerned about my child's education. I'm not gonna go to an area that has a crappy school system, right? I want the best for my child. So all of these things are like driven by education and, and, and more fundamentally higher education, right? Uh, um, you know, rich technical market, right? These universities can be a source of innovation, innovation and that can be a source for growth for companies. Okay, so if we're talking about the region, right, my decision to get an education, okay, yeah, I'm gonna earn more, but I'm also gonna be adding to, well, if I decide to go into healthcare, I'm, I'm adding to the quality of healthcare, okay? I'm adding to these cultural amenities, okay? If I get a culinary arts degree, Okay, and I can make the best souffles anywhere, right? I'm adding to that, that, that stock of cultural amenities, and it's a benefit that like, really exceeds me, okay? Um, so, this is a nice quote, right? The continuing pipeline of talent, all that stuff. Um, and and it's, it's kind of anecdotal. Uh, we, we could get really ugly and put all sorts of like, equations up here and do all sorts of like, statistical analysis to show this, but I, I think anecdotally, uh, I, I hope I've at least somewhat demonstrated that, hey, there's an externality that's positive associated with someone's decision to, like, uh, uh, go to an institution of higher ed. Okay? Uh, any questions at this point about externalities or human capital? So there's a word external in there, right? Yeah. Okay. So there, there's a, a, a something external to the decision making, right? So so um, like a, a, you know the cigarette smoke, right? Like I'm impacting people other than me if I decide to smoke a cigarette, right? It's external. Um, if I get inoculated against some awful disease, 
like, yes, internally I benefit because like I'm not going to get it, I'm not going to get ill, but you're benefiting because I can't come in here and sneeze and get you ill. Right? It's something external. It goes beyond the decision making. Okay? Yes. So human capital, um, so like the word capital, manufactured in production, right? It, it, it combines with labor to make labor more productive. So imagine I give you a shovel and tell you to dig something, right? But then I give you a lot more capital, like in the form of like some big caterpillar equipment, like a backhoe or a bulldozer, and I ask you to dig, right? Like that more capital is gonna make you more productive. You'll be able to dig, dig a much larger hole in a shorter time, okay? So human capital is things like education, uh, on-the-job training, less formal things like on-the-job training, uh, uh, the longer that you're in a position, right, you, like your tenure, um, is gonna make you more experienced, and that like stack of knowledge is gonna make you more productive, just like that big piece of equipment does in digging a hole, except uh, here, you, you're using your mind, right? But, it, but it's embedded, right? It's inseparable from you once you, you, you attain it, unless you have some horrible trauma. Right? Like it can't be taken away from. Okay? So, okay. Alright, anything else? Alright. Uh, yeah, so, let's see, did I want to say anything else about the externalities in the PayPal quote? Educated workforce, universities are a source of both uh, skilled labor and innovation. Uh, the access to amenities, quality of healthcare, quality of K through 12 education, and people are just generally nicer. Okay, uh, and that's important, right? All right. So trends in higher education, right? We're talking about higher education funding. Okay. Um, so we talked about what education does to the individual, um, what it does to the community. And in the context of these two things, um, I find these trends alarming, okay? Um, and so we can make the link to like, hey, what's wrong with higher education funding right now, okay? Um, so there's four big trends. There's a decrease in state funding for higher ed. And, and, and I have, uh, the next slides we'll talk about that. Increased cost of tuition, okay? Um, Debt, student debt, right, uh, uh, is now like the means with which you finance this education. And then I wrote the adjunctification of higher ed. Okay, so there's fewer tenure uh, related positions. They're relying more on uh, temporary uh, instructors, adjuncts, contingent faculty, however you want to uh, call them. But more than that, even our staff, right? We, we represent uh, classified and, and some uh, uh, student support staff at, at is my union, but there, there's a huge reliance on part-time temporaries, right? Somebody will retire from a full-time job, and like someone part-time temporary that doesn't quite have the same amount of skills have that, um, and all of this is in response to the decrease in state funding, okay? Um, and there's some other consequences that we'll get to, yes? So Mark, I just want to chime in one really good example of that adjunctification. If you're a student and you've gone from office to office trying to find something, please raise your hand. If you've been able to find the you know, place that does the grants, or you know, if you can't find the career service center, you might go to what three offices, four offices before you find what you need. A lot of the staff that are helping you along the way are new or temporary or hourly. They don't have wealth of knowledge of what services we offer to students and where those services are. Now you might go to an office and there's someone there that has been there for years. They know exactly what you're looking for, they can tell you exactly where to go, and they understand what you might need going into that. And then you can go with that information confidently with the office. That's because that person has worked there and through that experience built that up as human capital. They have the understanding of where to go, what the students need, and you know where that's located in the college. And so that's a good example between those two, right? Yeah, that's perfect, thank you. Uh, anyone else have an example of, uh, well, I mean, you know, we, we have slides coming up, so maybe uh, when we get to these slides, uh, if you have a personal narrative that's uh, 
illustrative of like what this results in, please. Um, and I had some anecdotal uh, uh, experiences as well. So decrease in state funding. Um, well, community colleges, community technical colleges, this is probably a bit more, but uh, uh, the average uh, uh, across the United States for institutions of higher ed that are public, okay? 10% of the operating budget comes from the state. Okay, so the rest of it comes from foundation, the rest of it comes from tuition and fees, um, uh, marketing, right? Um, so, so, you know, it's kind of bad when it used to be around 40%. Okay, uh, the UC system was almost 100% funded, right? Okay, so this changed a lot, and then just from 1990, that academic year, to the 2009 academic year, 26.1% is the, the decrease across the, the nation. Okay, so this has some implications, right? One, they have to save costs, the adjunctification, the higher tuition, okay? Um, yeah, so here, I just wrote, you know, this shift in legislative priorities is shifting the burden of higher education costs onto your backs, okay, and your parents' backs, okay? Where it used to be, like, they recognized, like, hey, you know, education is a public good, that externality, that positive externality is present. You know, we have an obligation to, to like, our citizenry, right? Um, right now, that's not the priority. It, it, it's going away. And one of the examples, which is right here, well, first of all, so in the area, right? So there's Shoreline, we have the Seattle Colleges, we have Highline, we have Bellevue, and we have Green River, okay? Shoreline is the only institution in this area that maintained community in the area. Everyone else is just a college, okay? So, like, where did our community go? Okay, here's an example from Green River. It's an inside higher ed piece, okay? Um, and I, I, I'm not a xenophobe. Uh, I'm just gonna say that right up front, but, you know, international students, okay, there's a lot of money that's not being spent, it's not being invested in the faculty and staff, it's not being invested into the, 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 the structures and the facilities on campus, it's being spent to recruit people in, in California, abroad, so on and so forth. Like, I don't know, maybe that's a problem if, if, if you're chartered to serve the community, right? So here we just have college now, um, but yeah, so at, at Green River College, right, um, th they make up the budget shortfall from the state, okay, because out-of-state tuition costs a lot more than in-state tuition, okay? So that's how they're making up for the, the shortfall of funding from the state, is by relying on international and out-of-state students, okay, to the point where, um, well, so 24% and then the non-ESL, right, some people they have a program. It's like you get some proficiency in, in, in English and then you move on to a four-year institution. But this is just the academic, non-ESL, it's 20%. One out of five students is international in Green River Community College. Um, maybe that's why they had to drop the community from their name. Okay? Um, as a taxpayer, and again, I'm not trying to be xenophobic, I'm just saying that like, a mission of, of this university, or of this institution, is to serve the community. Okay? Students come here, they get an education, they move on to UW, they go back to their home country. Home country. Our region's not benefiting from, from the human capital, right? 20%, right? We're losing 20% of the stock of human capital as you return home. So maybe our region could benefit more, right? It's my claim. I hope I'm not being controversial, but like, it's, it's, we're serving a community. Like this, this institution was chartered to serve the area of Seattle, right? Um, its focus isn't, and then the recruiting expense, right? That, that's not being invested into the, into the facilities, it's not being invested in faculty and staff, um, and we lose the stock of human capital. Yes? So, so how does, how, how does a community college or a former community college, I mean, I think that the name change has, has a lot, has lots of different parts to it. Right. Right? Um, including just wanting a change in perception because of, you know, the same with everyone changed from junior to community. Right, yeah, it's, but, it's, there's some prestige to it. Right, but how do you serve the community without money? We need to change the legislative priorities. 
I, I, I like, I, yeah, the, the last slide, there is a Senate bill um, that, that would make me, like, we'll, we'll talk about it, but essentially you apply for FAFSA, okay, you, you get all the money, and then the rest of your, your uh, tuition and fees, and you even get a book stipend, uh, um, would be paid for. And that's for Washington residents. Um, you have to maintain a certain GPA, you have to finish like 120 credits within five years. You can't previously have had a, a bachelor's degree. The, 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 there's, there's some things, but there's, there's a Senate bill. Um, you know, uh, it's a start. It's a start of the conversation. And, and I have what to do next. Okay. Yeah, that's the last, second to last slide. Um, but I, I just, the effect of the decrease in state funding, this is one of the results. And, and you know, quite honestly, I, I think the increased tuition, the increased reliance on part-time and contingent faculty um, are, are, are much greater impacts. Um, but this is an impact. Um, you know, there's a lot of problems. Like it, it's uh, <laughs> Green River Community, Green River College has a lot of problems with its faculty, with its staff. Okay, um, and a lot of that is in a response to wanting to change the mission of the university. There's programmatic changes, right? Um, you know, uh, I don't know. There's this move to treat you guys as customers, okay? If, if I, and I was a professor, an adjunct. But, um, you know, it's like, oh, these are your customers, these are your customers. Well, I'm there to, like, meet some, like, educational objectives, okay? If I view you as a customer, I want you to be happy. Okay, so do I compromise, like, you know, my discipline's integrity, or do I make you happy, right? So like, like treating students as a customer is problematic because, well, we want you to be happy. Okay, we're not gonna invest in, in, in permanent faculty. We're not gonna invest in, in things, but no, we're gonna have a climbing wall on the student side, right? Because you guys should be entertained, you should be happy. Well, you're here to get an education, okay? I'd rather have you hate me and, and leave my class, like meeting some, some objectives, right? M meeting s s some uh, 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 list of uh, competencies, okay, and having learned, then then you being a fan. Um, so th that that's a result of all of this. Um, tuition, right? Um, so yeah, uh, from two thousand two that academic year to two thousand twelve. Uh, um, it was 39%, uh, and that's after adjusting for inflation at public universities versus 27% uh, for private nonprofit schools. Okay, we, we haven't talked about for profit yet. Um, and then from 85 to 2013, right, it was 500% increase in tuition. Um, and healthcare is in the news a lot. Okay, so it outpaced even healthcare. Okay, so tuition is more expensive. Okay, that's shifting the burden from everybody paying a little bit through property taxes or sales tax here in, in Washington to like individuals, okay, through tuition. Okay, and how do we finance it? We go into debt. Okay. Student debt in the state of Washington. So like in terms of the amount, the average amount of debt and the number of the graduating class in 2014. Okay, um, uh, do I have a ranking? I thought it was like, there's an increase 40 cents, so. Oh yeah, Washington ranked is 40th, okay, so we're not bad. Number one was Delaware, okay, and that's 62% of the graduating class of 2014, okay, with an average of 33,000. Uh, 50th uh, was Utah. Same, like, right? So 42% of the graduating class and then an average of 18, okay? Um, so that's a lot, right? 58%, more than half the students that graduated with an associate's or bachelor's degree in 2014 uh, lost their student loan debt. What's the implications of that? You can't buy a house. Exactly, right? So like you get done if you're on a standard repayment plan, right? You get about a six month like break from the time you, you lose your full-time status, right? And then you're on a 10-year repayment plan, okay? If you want to save for a down payment for a home, right? Like, your down payment's gonna, like, impact what? 
the interest rate you get on your mortgage and, and the mortgage payment, right? So it's nice to save for that. Well, if you're making these student loan payments, okay, it's gonna be much more difficult to save. And then in a city like Seattle, where the housing market, rental markets are tight, you have like, you know, no, people with all right incomes renting, okay, that really puts a squeeze on people in the service industry, right? That's gonna jack up the rents, the gentrification is just gonna, you know, be much worse. Okay, and then for the community, um, if you have more people renting versus owning, do you think that has some sort of impact on society? You don't have an incentive to upkeep your rental. You don't get the you don't get the equity. You don't get to resell, right? Maybe you move more frequently, so you don't have those roots. You're not as vested in the community. If you live in like Auburn and commute into Seattle because it's too darn expensive. Right, and you're making these student loan payments, right? You just show up, you punch in, you punch out. Who cares what's happening out on the street, right? Like, like it, it has an impact on society, okay? Um, and then nationally, it gets even worse, right? And I had to put this just to show all of the zeros, okay? So there's a cumulative amount of 1.2 trillion, okay? That's the cumulative sum of student loan debt, 1.2 trillion, okay? Uh, so this is 2014, so uh, 2013, right? $34 billion, right, just went to interest, okay? What's our major source of revenue for the state of Washington? Sales tax. Sales tax, okay? These payments go to Virginia, okay? This interest isn't here in the state of Washington, right? So if, if we go back, there was the, the, the um, what was it, it was about the class of 2014, right, the average 24,000, okay, whatever those payments are for, for this 58%, that's money that's not being spent in Washington, that's money that's not like supporting a small business, that's money that's not generating uh, sales tax revenue for our vital services for this institution, right, this is a public institution, um, so it's, it's pretty bad, right? And in the nation, 40 million people owe debt, 8.3% or about 3.3 million uh, have defaulted, okay? With over 3 million people in default, okay? Maybe it's not their problem, maybe there's a problem with the system. Maybe there's a problem with the way in which we finance higher ed. Okay, and there's been some clever approaches to this Oregon has a pay-as-you-earn thing, so it's like you, you graduate from any Oregon State uh, uh, institution, um, you pay 10% of your income for like, uh, I believe it's 20 or 25 years, which is nice, but it doesn't solve the fact that state funding has decreased, it doesn't solve the fact that tuition increased, it's just a need, another refinancing scheme, okay? So student debt is, is, is a problem, and then once you're in default, your FICA score goes down, right? You're paying more for auto loans, you're paying more for home loans. Um, you know, the interest rate on a mortgage may be prohibitive. Maybe you'll have to continue to rent, okay? Um, you know, I'm sure there's some tradespeople. Well, they're probably pretty happy here in the area. But like maybe there, you know, um, maybe there would be new housing construction, right? And, and like, okay, we build a new home, I'm a tradesperson, I get paid, what do I do with my money? I spend it in your shop, okay? You buy stuff and spend some of the income that you pay yourself in another shop. There's a multiplier effect to this, right? It, it's good for the community, it's good for the region. Um, and right now, there's a lot of money leaving Washington, okay, going to Virginia, okay? And, and you know, like, the, the, the Department of Ed makes a lot of money on these interest payments, okay? But unfortunately, that money's not being reinvested in our education system, it's sort of like Social Security. Every other government agency borrows from it, and if, you, if there was a drawer that had the $34 billion of interest payments, right, what you'd find, much like Social Security, would be a bunch of IOUs, okay? So, so this isn't being reinvested into our education institutions. Um, it, it, it's for every other government agency at the federal level to borrow from, okay? Um, yeah. Terrifying? Enraging. No? Huh? Enraging. <laughs> right, yeah. You're, you're going through it. I, I have payments. <laughs> um, 
Adjunctification of higher ed. Um, yeah, contingent faculty of the faculty body um, is 70% of the faculty body across the nation. Okay? Um, you know, and this doesn't say how many courses are being taught by adjunct because, you know, they may just get like three credits and that's it for a semester. Where uh, someone that's uh, tenure related is probably teaching like maybe nine credits and doing some research and stuff. But there's a problem with this. Okay, so I, I was an adjunct for about four years. Um, at the end of the spring semester, we had semesters. Uh, grades were due on this date. That day, my email was shut down because I was I was adjunct. I was contingent. What did that mean? Okay, if students want a letter of reference, like how do they get a hold of me? Right? We had an office. There was a phone with a, a voicemail thing, but like I don't know. I didn't have time to sit there in my office too much. I had to like commute between four campuses in the city of Milwaukee, Wisconsin. Okay. That, that was my life, okay? Um, if I had applied, I would have applied for some sort of like heating assistance in the winter because, you know, rent was this amount and, you know, add $300 for heat in, in, you know, my house that was built in 1895 that's in Milwaukee, Wisconsin, where it's 10 below for a month, right? Um, so I, I wasn't able to, um, my email was shut off because I was adjunct status, okay? Um, my office was really a Milwaukee County Transit System. I was on a bus reading, grading, sometimes I'd fall asleep, like I'd have to get off at 27th. I don't know how many times I woke up at like 105th, 110th, right? <laughs> um, but like, I, I couldn't, just the email, in and of itself, the email. No letters of reference, how do you handle it incomplete? You know, if students liked me and they wanted some advice on what courses to take in the fall, like how do they get a hold of me? Okay, well, I put my personal email address as well as my marquette.edu address uh, on my syllabus so that they could contact me, but I wasn't involved in any committees, right? I had no, no decision over the textbook, right? Um, like, I had no voice. It's just I, sh I showed up, I, I essentially punched in, I taught a class, I punched out, I, I ran to another campus at a different institution. Um, so I, I truly believe, and this is anecdotal, I, 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 um, I understand that, and Ty had a good example, but like having the contingent faculty, you don't have the loyalty, right? You don't have the time, you don't have the luxury, right? Uh, um, you, you have to eat, you have to pay rent. So I was at University of Wisconsin-Milwaukee, I was at Milwaukee Area Technical College, I was at Marquette University. Okay, so three institutions, four different campuses, patching together an income so that I could survive. And I'm not looking for pity, I'm just saying that this severely impacted educational outcomes. And Ty also had a perfect example at the beginning. And I, I would be happy to entertain any anything that you may have experienced. Mm -hmm. I also want to know that it impacts student learning as well, because if you have a bunch of adjuncts who may not actually find out that they're teaching a class until a week before the yep. class starts. Yeah. They have not had time to look over the curriculum. They have not had time to review the textbook to make sure that it's actually going to meet the needs of the students in that class. You have someone who's coming in doing their best, but has been set up to, to not be able to teach in the best conditions. And it really impacts student learning, your experiences. Um, so and on the spring, uh, I remember uh, finding out the Friday. Monday was uh, Martin Luther King Day, and Tuesday the semester was starting. I found out the Friday that the following Tuesday I have a course, and it was a section I had never taught before. And it's like, you know, I, it was it was lucky. And it, it was enough just to get the syllabus ready, you know. Well, I also say that you know that our adjunct faculty do a wonderful job making that seamless, so you guys aren't aware of that. But you know, not only in these sort of hardships that the adjuncts go through or the impacts it has upon you as students, there's other negative externalities out there. If they can't choose what textbook is being given to you, they have no control over the cost of that, how much you're paying for textbooks, which textbook are actually required, and that goes into the price of those textbooks. Because if the captive audience and the publisher knows that, they'll keep the price up and keep those textbooks and new editions slim, which costs more for you. If they were you know, tenured, they have a wealth of other material they can give you. They can cut down on how many textbooks you need. And they can also say that last year's version is perfectly fine. There's still nothing stock. 
go get the cheap version, that's the one we're going to use. So it has that negative externality additionally mm -hmm. towards you. Yeah, and the irony is the graduate teaching assistants, the assistant, um, I, I did have discretion over my textbook, and I found a free PDF that I mailed to everybody. They didn't have to buy a textbook. I, you know, and it wasn't the best, and I, I, I supplemented it with things, but like I had that discretion, and I'm like, no, no, you, you're not buying the textbook, you know. Um, but you know, I, I've had classes where you get three textbooks, and the, the least expensive one was like 175 dollars. I mean. It's not just tuition, and like quite honestly, probably the largest cost of your education is the opportunity cost. Okay, um, so you're here, you're studying, right? Um, you could be earning your income somewhere else. So that foregone income is a very real cost to like your education. Um, so add that on top of tuition, textbooks, fees, right? Um, like the, 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 I think the, the largest is like your foregone income, right? Um, and, and if you are working your tail off at night, you know, I don't know, instead of like four years for like a, a, a undergraduate degree, maybe five or six, right? So you're still limiting your ability to earn, right? You're still foregoing some income. Um, you may be tired. Who knows what that does to the quality of your education? Um, you know, I, I don't know the statistics. I, I, I didn't do too much, but there's a problem with homeless students across the state. And across this country, right? Um, it's it's awful. And, and the credit card companies prey on you guys. Like you didn't come here for debt. You came here to get inspired. You came here to get educated. Um, and and that, that should be the mission. And that's why I say, where did the community and my community college go, right? Um, I don't know. For me, that that that's huge, right? But the fact that they're taking communities out of community colleges. Um, I, I find that really troubling. I find that really problematic. Um, you know, these buildings aren't the, the college. Uh, the, the administration's not the college. You, the faculty and the staff, are what make this what it is. You're the college, okay? Um, and taking the community out of that, you know, it's like the trustees and the administration and a line item on a budget. Okay, and that's being proselytizing a, a bit. But like that's why I think this is really a problem when we talk about education funding. Okay, um, so I have a, a nice graph. Uh, so this came from uh, the American Federation of Teachers. Uh, they, they had a, a periodical called um, uh, "On the Backs of uh, Students and Families," um, but it shows the trends. So these green bars, that's enrollments. Okay, this like purple line is the tenure-related faculty over time. This other kind of purple color um, is all faculty, right? So the vertical distance between these two are the adjuncts, okay? So to keep pace with the increased enrollments, right, they're hiring more contingent faculty, is what this is showing. It's showing over time. Um, yeah, that turned out pretty well, right? It, it, it looks nice on the big screen. Not so much on my computer screen, but it looks like it. Right? But, but so this is the trend that they're showing. Um, I don't know, I, I think we already talked a bit about how this, this is troublesome, but you know, it, it's not like flattening, it's not like starting to go down. I think we're gonna expect that to continue. Um, as you attended uh, faculty retire, um, I think those tenure lines are, are probably vanishing, okay? Um, and if you're at a big university like UW, um, the tenure faculty probably are spending more of their time bringing in grant money, doing research, and less educating. Uh, the actual rolling up your sleeves, interacting with students, and conducting the uh, uh, education, the, the classroom part of uh, uh, that institution is that, that, that burden, not burden, it's a pleasure, it's an honor to have been in the classroom, um, that, that's falling on the contingent faculty. More and more. Um, what to do? One, I don't want you to be discouraged. Keep investing in your futures, right? Uh, two, hey, this is a conversation, right? If you're fortunate enough to like find yourself at like a town hall at one of your state legislators holding, you know, 
Ask about this. Say that you're alone. Okay? Talk to each other. Okay? If you're part of a student group or your staff and you're part of a union, um, I don't know, you, you go to like a, a place of worship on Saturday, you go like, wow, isn't this a problem? Okay? Talk about it. Talk about how it impacts you. Uh, uh, don't just like complain or, or, or like gripe all the time. Talk about like what a solution would look like. Um, and then I mentioned earlier, I, I don't know, it's a habit of mine. I can't do any kind of presentation, I can't produce any kind of piece of paper without having an explicit ask on there. Well, there is a Senate Bill 6481 that would make community and technical colleges free to Washington residents. Okay? Um, if you call this hotline and you say, hey, I'm in the 37th or whatever, right? They'll get you to like either voicemail or staff person, you can leave a message, you can say, hey, community college is the economic driver of the state and the region. I'm a community college student, support this bill. Um, and then if you want the slides or you have any questions, that's me. Um, but right now, obviously, we have 10 minutes and I'd love to hear from you. Yes. So what are some ways that students can deal with their student debt? One of the ways they can deal with their student debt. Um, so when you get your like uh, financial aid award letter, like the default is the max, okay? So th this is this is way things are currently are, right? It, it has like the, the max, okay? So think sincerely um, about how much of that you truly need, all right? You don't have to accept all of it, but like the default is the max. This is money you have to pay back. This is money if it's a, a subsidized student loan. The minute you lose your full-time status as a student, starts accruing interest. If it's unsubsidized, the moment that you disperse it, it starts accruing interest. Okay, so like one, think sincerely, recognize that you have to pay it back, and think sincerely about how much of that you truly need. Okay, um, once you graduate, uh, there's uh, uh, income-based repayment plans that are federally sponsored. Okay, so it's essentially 20 uh, or 25% of your income you pay for um, no, no, I'm sorry, it's 10 or 15 percent of your income that you pay for 20 or 25 years, right? But it's a percentage of your income, okay? Um, at the end of the 20 or 25 years, whatever is remaining is discharged. Um, there's those programs you can roll in. And then I would say seriously consider the public service, okay? So you can enroll in the income-based repayment plan, okay? You can lower your monthly payment. And then if you're in the public service, you work for a state, uh, entity, like the, the state of Washington pays your paycheck, uh, the King County or Seattle, the city of Seattle, like a school district or whatever, right? If you enter the public service and a public entity signs your paycheck and pays you, um, you can enroll in what's called public service loan forgiveness. Okay, so you essentially make 120 payments, that's 10 years, right? And then tax-free, whatever debt's left over is forgiven. Okay, so it's an incentive for you to en enter the public service and, you know, I mean, the public service, I don't know if you've seen it, it's, it's getting older, we need some fresh faces, we need some bright, energetic people to do this. Um, you know, a lot of our state agencies are chronically understaffed, okay, and this is an incentive for you to enter it, but I also think this is a professional career that you find in enriching, um, and, and it make you, like, more connected to your community than anything you could possibly imagine. Yes. And for the public service loan forgiveness, you don't necessarily have to work at like a state or a city uh, organization. If you, it's well, 501 C3. 501C3 organization, so nonprofit organizations, you can also apply for public service loan forgiveness. Right, and um, the exceptions there are mm -hmm. if you're union staff, George W. Bush signed this in the law, so I guess he had a problem with union staff. Um, and then if you work for like a large congregation, mm -hmm. You can't be like the, the, the pastor or the mom or the, 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 the rabbi. Okay, so as long as you're not like the spiritual head of like the, the religious organization, like if you're the organist or the, the uh, custodian for it, you qualify if it's 501c3. Um, so, yes, thank you. Uh, any other questions? So, in full disclosure, this is Ty. 
Um, so he's the president of Local 304, um, which is part of the American Federation of State, County, Municipal Employees, Council 28. Um, and he also is staff here. So that's why I, 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 you're asking a lot of questions. <laughs> <laughs> Anything else, please? Okay, so what's your opinion on the, the different presidential, um, uh, I, I guess at this point they're, they're just ideas about um, paying for Right, um, so O'Malley and Clinton keep talking about debt-free educa higher education. Uh, Bernie Sanders says like free education for all. Um, you know, and, and there's, Obviously, there's big ticket prices to, to both of them. Um, I think all three of them are on track. Um, you know, the, the, there's a problem, right? So if education is free for all, you know, enrollments are going to go through the roof, and then you're going to have like ACT scores or SAT scores probably like excluding people from these institutions, right? That, 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 that's a potential uh, uh, thing that could result. Um, there's an issue of equity, fairness, right? If I have the ability to pay, maybe I should pay. So I, I kind of like the debt free. It's like, hey, you know, uh, pay what you can. We don't want to unduly burden you for like 25 years after you graduate, right? So the debt free part I really like, right? Um, and I like the equity uh, aspect of like, if, if you have the ability to pay, you should pay. Um, but if you don't have the ability to pay, you also have access to like a quality public uh, education, uh, you know, in, in higher ed. Um, so, personally, I mean, I'm a, okay, I'm voting for Bernie. I'm going to caucus for Bernie. Um, but I, I really do like the, the debt free over the free. So, and then I don't think anyone on the Republican side is talking about this. They're too busy slandering each other. But that's just my opinion. <laughs> are you in favor of the debt free? Because can you say why you're in favor of the debt free a little bit more? Over is it is it more community based or is it more the individual based or the quality of the education? Like what's your reason for? Um. Well, I, I think just the the, the um, cost of it overall one, and, and two like I don't know like having something invested in your education is an horrible thing, right? Um, like if it's given, if, if you're given everything, everything's given to you free in your life, right? You probably don't appreciate much, right? Um, so that's just kind of me. That's that's the the mores I was raised with. Um, but I, I think if you have the ability to pay, you should, right? Um, so if your household income is like six hundred thousand dollars, right? Um, a free education, you know, versus someone who like you know thirty thousand dollars a free education. I, I, I think that if, if you have the ability to contribute, you should contribute. I, I, I just think it's fair. So what about K-12? K-12? Should that be free or not? Well, it largely is. Um, I think we need to finance it differently. Um, you know, the property tax and levy, uh, you know, a depressed area, a property tax levy of a certain percent of a much smaller uh, uh, revenue base, is a lot less for education, right? Um, I, I, I think K through 12, largely public school, it, it is free. Um, I just think it needs to be prioritized better. Um, you know, uh, there are schools failing, and, and quite frankly, I, as somebody that taught in colleges, you know, I, I taught economics, and before I could even get to like some microeconomic principles, like I had to do a lot of like, oh, well, this is a linear equation. You know, like I, I had to do that because they weren't receiving it in their high schools, um, and that that it, it carried over to the, the university experience. Um, and I don't blame the teachers; I, I blame the fact that they're stuck for resources. Um, uh, yeah, K through twelve, it, it's it's important, right? I mean, by the time you're, I don't know, like in middle school. You know, like so much is already kind of like determined, right? Like, like I can't, I can't say as like a twelfth grade like math teacher, right? My performance, you know, is contingent on like eleven years prior of teachers, right? And, and same with like somebody teaching an entry level like physics, math, 
English, whatever class, right? Um, so I, if we start in K through 12, I, I, I think um, our students will be able to accomplish a lot more when they arrive here. Um, yeah. Did that answer your question? I feel like I did the talk around thing. Okay. Anything else, please? Yes. Um, I strongly agree with your comments about the community being taken out of this um, these colleges when they're taken away um, out of the name. Because uh, as the parent club president, I realized that especially on this campus, a lot of um, benefits for parents have been taken away and replaced with benefits for international students because that's who they're trying to recruit and they're trying to push parents to the campuses on the outer edges. Um, even though parents are part of this community, they're not as welcome here. They've taken the daycare space and given it to the international program. They took the mommy and or the parent playgroup space and given it to the international program. There's very little funding for um, parent uh, activities, and it's kind of hard to get. You kind of have to pay for it for extra funding for things that parents need. And um, just finding a space or having a space where parents can go or taking classes. A lot of parents will be involved in the social and human services set, and you have to take classes at night, and there's no daycare available at night. But there's no daycare available here. The program's not available at the other campuses where there is daycare. Mm -hmm. So it, it has become really hard to be, we have a lot of students that are leaving and going to different colleges because it's hard to be a parent there. I, I, I was fortunate um, to experience that. But, uh, yeah, no, I, I think uh, it, it's not certain the community, right? I mean, you're a parent, you want to care for your children. Um, but you also want to have the ability to like give them more than you have, and like this education, this human capital, right? Like up until like probably like the Great Depression and World War II, uh, intergenerational income mobility. Okay, so like one of the largest factors of what determined your ability to earn was your parents' income, right? And, and like the GI Bill and expanding uh, 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 access to higher education broke that. Okay, and now access is being broken, so we're gonna go back. And I mean, you know, I, I don't wanna sound cruel, but it's like, hey, you can either invest in education, invest in these young mothers um, while they're trying to get an education, or you can keep them on assistance for the rest of their life. What's well, more cost effective? And it sounds cruel, and I don't wanna reduce it to that. It's, it's real, but I mean, it, it's kind of the reality. It's like, you know, you, you wanna make this investment, or you wanna, you know, it is, hey. and a lot of time they will offer like a certificate program so you can just get in and out as quickly as possible, but the certificate programs are not realistic, like you're going to have a career from it. Okay. So, so you, you can't take that certificate and translate it into a, a, a Yeah, a lot job. of times people do the certificate. I did the certificate program 10 years ago for cooking, and you can't even get a cooking job when you come out of the school because no one wants someone with a certificate. They want a degree or they want experience. Okay. Yeah, so it's a good joke. And then they have these classes at night that are like 6.30 to 8.30 or 5 o'clock to 9 o'clock. You can't even, even if they'll fund daycare for you, you can't get daycare that late at night. So mm -hmm. it's just not set up so that parents will be able to benefit from it. And parents are at the I I agree with you. It's really unfortunate. Sorry. <laughs> it wasn't my priorities. <laughs> Let's thank our speaker. Thank you. Thank, you. thank you. thank you all for coming. If, if there's a lot of time you have any specific questions, then feel free to ask Mark if he has time to answer your questions. Yeah, I can stick around for, I have 20 more minutes on the meter. Okay, thank you so much. Thank you.